Well, Richard, thanks for joining us today on the next in the series of Cyberside Chats. How are you doing? I'm um, great, thank you. Thanks for uh, letting me be here. Absolutely. Glad to have you in San Diego. And so, uh, you know, I know we just completed Data Privacy Day. Uh, can you give us uh, kind of perspective on, on Data Privacy Day and where we've been, where we're going? Well, I, I, I was really thrilled with what happened yesterday. <clears throat> we had more stakeholders than we've seen a more diverse group of stakeholders we've seen in the conversation. We talked about a, a wider scope of commercial activities and what it meant for uh, information management, for responsible use of that information, uh, for transparency, for access to the information. I mean, the kinds of language that we use, which is straight down the, the fair information uh, practices principles, uh, from energy, from uh, you know the military, from all of these sources, the conversation was delightful. Now, that being said, it's taken us a long time. We've been eight years now that we've been having Data Privacy Day, but there were, uh, what, eight, 12 different events yesterday at least? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there were 20 or 30 altogether, uh, but at least eight to 12 that were really major events that really brought together a diverse group of people. Um, and that's, that's great. That, we need all the voices we can have in this conversation because solutions don't just come up they evolve through these dialogues in a way that we have to understand it, it's always going to evolve. It's, we're not going to get there. We're always going to be on that journey. And as new technologies come in, as new industries take it up. I mean, who ever thought that, that the gas and utility industries would be deeply involved in security and privacy conversations? Well, they are and they should be. Um, and this is a really good thing. So yeah. I, I loved yesterday. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I was glad to see with the FTC report that just came out, they're going to engage in the grassroots efforts because I think right. you're right. That's the way we will get broad solutions to these these difficult problems. I, I agree. And then and then you know that's the domestic side of it for the most part. Uh, but you know the international side is is equally valuable. And I know that there was an event in Brussels. I haven't heard how it went, but we're going to find out. We, we need to keep working toward making this a both transatlantic, transpacific, uh, and trans-Caribbean kind of conversation and just draw more in. It'll evolve. We'll get there. I, I'm, I'm real happy with where we are right now. And I really look forward to getting more people into this conversation. And frankly, that Privacy Day, it's great. Once a year, it's great. It's Necessary, not sufficient. We've yep. got to do this much more frequently, too. We do, and I think you know we'll be doing a lot. I'm sure in October and between now right. and then, when we have Cybersecurity Awareness Month, um, one of the, the things obviously we focused on here in San Diego was IoT, which we got lucky that I guess the FTC released their <laughs> report the day before. So That's pretty cool. It was. It was. How do you see privacy and security impacting IoT, sort of based on what we heard yesterday? What you What you think? Well, I, you know, so it, obviously the whole idea of having what we used to call big, uh, before we had buzzwords like IoT, we, we used to call it big, which was a billion interconnected gadgets, right? And uh, all of that means that we're going to live in a monitored network. We're not going to have kind of a natural environment. We're going to have an environment that's monitored with sensors. It reacts to what we're doing. It responds in certain ways. It analyzes all of that. Um, so it's not that IoT affects privacy and security or the opposite, it's, it, it's just, it is what it is. We are going to live yeah. in, a, in, a, in a world that we have always characterized from Orwell to Panopticon and all this, we've always thought of surveillance as being a negative thing. Well, it's not necessarily only negative. There's a lot of benefits to it. Now, how do you get, optimize the benefits, minimize the risks? That's what the conversation's about. Yep. Um, but I think that was the conversation we had when you know Brandeis wrote, uh, you know Brandeis and Warren wrote their law review on photography, portable yep. photography. Uh, you know, was, yep. that was the same conversation they were having yep. in 1894. Yeah. So no, that's right, and I think that it shows how I think there's issues other than the law that have to deal with this because we've been chasing technology since then, and right. the law still hasn't caught up, and so we've got to figure out a way to make this work. It, it, as technology evolves at an even faster pace than that. Right. I, I love the phrase I heard yesterday, um, you know, at the speed of legislation, we'll never get there, right? Yeah. So these, con these, these events, these dialogues, these conversations we're having are the solution path. Now, what will happen is we'll codify those discussions right. at some point. 
Well, that's fine, but those are just markers in the sand that mark where we've been. The conversation talks about where we're going, yep. and legislation will never do that. Couldn't agree more. Um, how do you see private industry sort of building trust as we move to this more monitored environment right. so that consumers actually will use it and, and trust it? You know, the question, right? Yep. So I think that, well, I believe firmly that we already have those models in place. And the models came from, first of all, product safety. It was all about what ingredients I'm using, what processes I'm, I'm using to put together. When I, when I purchased toothpaste, I had to know that I'm putting this in my, in my mouth, and, and I, I need to know that this is a trusted product. And, you know, the trust was all about uh, the ingredients and the kind of processes that lay behind that, and the regulatory standards to know there was some monitoring, that kind of thing. Um, so we already have that. It, 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 Others came, you know, with, with safety, cars, you know, it had their safety features of a car meant it was a more trustworthy uh, vehicle to, to put my family in, to put myself in. Um, I think the same, trust has always been the engine of economies, uh, whether it's money, whether it's products, whether it's services, trust is everything. Um, now as we move to a purely information-driven economic model, where digital economy is what we're doing. Regardless of the tangible front end, regardless of social media being about conversations people have with each other, it's frankly, it's an advertising-based, information-based business. That's what they do. Uh, that's how they make their, their revenues. That's how they buy servers and write code. So trust is the goal of every business in every way. The transition is, what does trust mean in a digital economy? And, and that really starts, the, that's where our conversation's been going lately. We've been talking about how honest are you being with individuals about what you're doing? And, and that doesn't mean, yeah, we, you know, we collect this kind of information, we give you access. Fair information practice principles are great, but we have to go beyond the letter and get into the spirit. Why, why are the fair information practices principles important? It's because if I'm honest with you about what we're doing, we can have a more trustworthy organ, uh, relationship. If we have that trustworthy relationship, I will do more for you, you'll do more for me, it's a virtuous cycle, right? Yep. If I break that trust, you'll go find somebody else to trust. Because whatever service I'm offering is something you want, you'll go find somebody who will offer that in a more trustworthy model. We are selling trust. I don't care if it's widgets, toothpaste, social media, we sell trust. Yep. And, and, and until we realize that and actually formulate our businesses based on a trust model, we actually won't have the kind of economic success we'd like to have. Or, better put, our competitor will out-compete out, out us on that salient issue. Yep. I couldn't agree with you more. We've seen you know this dialogue really form around I think in large part NCSA's efforts and, right. and how, how have you seen NCSA evolve and where do you think it can kind of help lead the conversation going forward? Yeah, you and I know it's a wonderful story. I mean it really really is. It's very heartwarming to see that uh, a, a, an organization like NCA is backed up by uh, companies that n understand that trust in technology and in technologically based services is vitally important to their economies and generally to their economies, I mean, to everybody's uh, benefit. So uh, NCSA has, is, is the place where I think that we can begin to understand that we're not talking about privacy as a discrete action or security as a discrete action. The fact is that if you really want to manage information, all information, all, not just personally identifiable information, but also confidential information about IP, confidential relationship information, reputation information, all information. If you're going to manage it optimally, you have to include privacy and security as component pillars, but they're not, they're not the only thing. And they're not ends in themselves. Right. They're methodologies that you apply to the trust model. And reliability, availability, accessibility, those are also have to be brought in there. Yeah. And, and I think we need to start talking about how not just how do we keep it private that's that's fine but that's like saying how do i make this green i mean it's yeah. like come on there's a whole lot more to it 
No, I agree, and I think private privacy is is such in some ways a misnomer. I mean, I always look at right. genetic information. I mean, right. we you know when we drink out of a glass, we leave it. It is not private, but yet we have it is sensitive, and therefore we have a lot of rules around when it can and cannot be used. And I think as we move, it sounds like where we're headed is really building trust through better information governance as a holistic concept. Absolutely, and MCSA is in a great position to be a, a thought leader and to bring together people. Now, what I really like about it too is uh, they're taking their job very seriously in being a convener of stakeholders for this dialogue that I've been referring to, and I think that that's, that's a great role for them. And, and, and the fact that they're kind of multivariant and they're, uh, it's a big tent and they have uh, you know, the skills to bring together people and they are maintaining a trust relationship with those stakeholders. All of that, it just is so, such good news uh, yeah. for, for where we want to go, where you and I yeah. know we have to go to That's be right. successful. That's right. Well, thank you again for coming in and talking. I know we all talked a lot yesterday, but a pleasure as always. My pleasure. Thanks thank you very you. much. Take care.